Hello, and welcome to the Pragmatic Product Chat series, where we tackle the biggest challenges facing today's product management, product marketing, and other market and data-driven professionals with some of the best minds in the industry. I'm Rebecca Calajaris for Pragmatic Institute and your host for today's episode. When we think about medical doctors, uh, we think about lots of things, but I'm not sure that we're always thinking about entrepreneurship or tech startups or employee culture development, Uh, but maybe we should, Uh, at least in terms of today's guest, Dr. Jonathan Bakhtari. Uh, Dr. Bakhtari brings over 20 years of clinical, administrative, and entrepreneurial experience. He has been a triple board certified physician, uh, internal medicine, pulmonary, critical medicine, so like real doctor chops here. Uh, He served as a clinical faculty for several medical schools. But I think what's really interesting for us today is that he is also the CEO of E-National Testing, E7 Health, and U.S. Drug Test Center. So he's got a really diverse background. Welcome, Dr. Bukhtari. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Rebecca. I'm really excited. All right. So today we have lots of questions, um, but I think I think it's really would be great for the audience listening uh, to get a little bit of a background of you, like the origin story. How did you get where you are today leading these companies and why are you so passionate about what you do? That's a great question. You know, originally I was just a sort of straight arrow physician where you know, I went to medical school, did all my training and started practicing medicine. But then slowly I got involved in, first of all, teaching got involved in clinical faculty at several med schools, as you said, and then subsequently started doing administrative stuff. I uh, served on committees, became chief of medicine uh, for one of the hospitals, and then got involved more in administrative work at the hospitals and insurance companies. It was a really a thing of one door opening another. and It wasn't really thought out. I mean, I don't think I really planned it that way, but every door opened another door. And before I knew it, there was these opportunities to really you know, change healthcare, but also just do things differently, leveraging technology. And as we got more and more involved in technology, uh, you know, the idea of doing our own startups and and trying to do things differently with the idea of reducing friction in the system and seeing if it can be done in a completely different way. I love that. And I know a lot of what you focus on too is sort of like focusing on customer and employee relationships as a key to accelerating growth, right? Really taking that idea of a bedside <laughs> manner and turning it differently, right? Within your organization. And I think that's just super interesting. You know what? You're the first person that's made that equation. Usually people don't get that thing that the, if you're good with talking with 10, 20 patients a day, you know, that should give you some skill sets to handle staff, employees, because, you know, on any given day, a physician sees 20 different people, let's say, each has its own personality, each has its own issues, their own anxieties, their own strengths. And you have to navigate 20 different conversations slightly differently. And so you wind up, actually, it's, the, it's really the best training you can imagine for mm. dealing with a, an organization. Because that, as I talk about a lot of my podcast, Bakhtari MD, we talk about how you have to look at people in your organization not as the same thing and Mm -hmm. everyone's different and you have to have slightly different approach. You still have to get what you need done, but you can't just say the same thing to 10 people the same way and expect to get the same result. It just won't happen. I also think in another way that it ties in really well is like when you're diagnosing as a doctor, there are absolutely test results, but that's part of the information that you use to find the the problem and, and figure out the answer. Right? The other part is the dialogue, right? It's it's the conversations. It's what we would call discovery with our yes. patients that's going to change. It's going to help you identify what's really happening here and what best way to do it. So like, again, that sort of thinking about both the data side and the soft side feels like it yeah. would be really applicable. Well, you know what? You, you're really hitting on all the main points because This is something that that shocks most people. In in medicine, one third of all visits, certainly to primary care doctors, are for reassurance, meaning there's nothing Mm. wrong. Mm. So your data is not even going to help you, right? So, I mean, your data will just tell you that, you know, so let's just say they're stressed out at work or they're having some issues at home that manifests itself in some sort of physical thing. And next thing you know, they're in your office. So, you know, you you could spend, you know, you could order a million dollars worth of tests or you can figure out that this is something else. So what you just said was really important because you can't just look at the data, right? Because the data would definitely not help you in these kind of uh, cases. 
And again, if you think one third, like one out of three people coming to see you, That's just crazy. want you to say, hey, you're okay. There's nothing wrong. You're going to be fine. Let's talk about whatever. But at the end of the day, you're not dying. You're good. You know, and uh, so I, I, it, you hit the nail on the head. You, you can't be data driven. Right. Certainly not alone. Like sometimes it's super important. And I would yes. think when you're dealing with employees, it would be very mm-hmm. much the same way. Right. So as you take all of your background from all your different places, teaching is also a great way of learning how to mm-hmm. motivate people. But how all of that has definitely shaped your leadership philosophy. Can you tell us a little bit more about like just in a big picture, when you think about leadership and employee development and taking all these pieces together, how would you sum up your philosophy? Well, the first thing I I have to do before we can get to philosophy is this ability to be a leader Mm -hmm. and enroll people into your vision is not a soft skill. You, You just don't have it because you're a nice guy or people like you, or you have a good sense of humor, you actually have to acquire skill sets. And mm-hmm. I think this is the, uh, you know, this is probably the number one mistake. Number one mistake is I'm a nice guy. You know, people like me for sure. I'll be a good leader. Mm-hmm. You know, I talk about the, the Peter principle, which is a, a known thing where, you know, just because you're super competent doesn't mean you're going to be a good leader. You, you know, just because someone's a great engineer, And they're the best engineer in the engineering department that doesn't really necessarily make them be able to be a great head of the engineering department. Now, they could acquire skill sets and become that. But I think that we confabulate being good at something as as also being able to lead. Now, you Mm. can, Mm -hmm. but you have to go and acquire those skill sets, whether it's through mentorships, programs, you know, you guys offer courses. I mean, there, there is ways to acquire skill sets. And you, you wouldn't say, oh, I'm a natural born pilot. Like, you know, I, 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 <laughs> I hope I, not. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm an, you know, I, I'm a, when it comes to landing 747s, uh, I'm, I'm a natural, <laughs> <laughs> right? You wouldn't say that. Right. So it's, it's the same thing. So the first thing you have to be cognizant of is that you have to go out and acquire skill sets on how to lead, how to motivate, how to hire, fire, how to enroll people into your vision how to get the best of people, how to value people, how to, you know, give them value, how to, you know, what I call micro mentoring them instead of of micromanaging them. That's great. And so these, these are all things that just because somehow you became the leader, it doesn't mean you have the skills. You know, sometimes Mm. people become the leader because it was their idea or they put up the money. But, you know, if, they don't pick the pilot on a plane by who put up the most money, right? The, the, it's who's got the skill set. So I think the first thing you have to understand when you're talking about what you were saying, which is how, how to enroll people into your vision and motivate them and hire and fire. You have to first go out and get the skills of either from a mentor or other places. I think that's really interesting too, because um, I do think unlike piloting, but sometimes we do think like, oh, this person is a natural born leader, right? Like people really like them and they want to follow them. And and you Mm -hmm. think of it as either soft skills or you can learn the way I did, which was be terrible at it. (laughs) I always apologize to the first few people (laughs) I managed. I was not nearly as good. (laughs) But But there are ways to do it more intently. Right. But because, but what you just said is also important because I think that's what people do. They they learn on the job, which I guess is okay if you want to crash the plane 10 right. times before. If you want to be a terrible yeah, manager yeah. for a few people. Right. Yeah. But, but that some, some, sometimes that becomes fatal. If you're, if you're yeah. in that phase of learning and you just did a startup and your mm. company fails or it never grows beyond a certain point. So some of it is recoverable. So this whole idea I'm going to learn from trying can, be, can cause you really irreparable harm in ways that you can't recover once you learn the skills, you know, the company, you know, whether you raise money for that company or however you got it, that that company now is gone. A great that you learned and great. You'll be better the next time, but that's a high price to pay. That's a high, as I call it, that the failure is a very high price tuition to pay to get those skill sets. So you're paying a big tuition uh, to learn that sometimes. and, and to your point, there are other ways of learning it. I love this concept of just the idea of it, micro-mentoring. Can we just talk a little bit more? Tell me a little bit more about it. Because by name, I'm like, I'm totally in. I love that idea. 
<laughs> right. I think a lot, a lot of leaders, when they, uh, you know, bring on a right-hand person or a head of marketing that, and they're going to help them by, you know, teaching them by micromanaging them, meaning mm. they're going to be involved and not really let them have much runway for the first year or two. And you can do that. But the other way to do it is actually spend time with them and discuss with them and give them some of these skill sets and allow them to do the, the, you know, flying the plane, but then checking in with you as long as you would give them a venue where they can throw questions by you. You know, one of the things I do for my, my leadership is when they're starting off is I say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to have access to your email. I'm going to get every email you send. I'm going to get every email uh, that comes to you. Uh, sometimes even the phone calls, of course, with permission, everyone knows, but, and then I get, so, I, and they would say, okay, l- let's meet, you know, every other day and let's talk about, I saw this email came to you. How, I saw you handled that, but you know, maybe in the future, maybe, you know, if they were really upset, maybe the better way is to do this and rather than that. So this, this call, I call micro mentoring. So you're not there actually making the decisions with them, but you have enough feedback from them and everything else that you can have these one, two hour conversations every week. But what that costs you is investing time in them. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing their job for them, spend an hour or two every week, whatever it is, and go over their decisions, go over their philosophy. Soon they'll start making the decisions you would have wanted them to make because they've already had so much back and forth with you. So there's two ways to get people to make the decisions you want to make. You could actually be there with them and say, make this decision, or you can just mentor them so much that they naturally become, you know, people tease me like a mini me, but in terms of philosophy of, of how we're going to run this business or how we're going to approach this book of business. So you can actually transmit that philosophy by just meeting with them and mentoring them rather than literally being in the cubicle with them and say, do this, don't do that. I, I don't know if that makes sense. Absolutely. If they understand how we think and what is driving our decisions, then they can apply mm-hmm. that to future decisions, right? So it's not like I have an answer to the current problem. That's great. I can give that to you in seconds. Uh, but if I spend the time to kind of teach you about like, here are the levers that matter and that are, we're driving towards as an organization, then they start to, that context allows them to apply that in an entirely different situation next time in a way yeah, that I- amplifies their learning. Hey, if I can add to that, that's what I always, so let's say we look at a bad email exchange or an email exchange that you would want to have been better. So you're, you're not there criticizing that email. You're saying, let's use this email as a launching pad hmm. to talk about how to deal with unhappy vendors. Yes. Or let's use this email as a launching pad to talk about, you know, how we can negotiate our pricing better. So, so... You, you let them know that we're not here just to, you know, put this email under a microscope and make you feel bad. We're, we're going to use this email to talk about a broader topic, which is how do we deal with, you know, um, product services that had issues or you know, we had quality control issues. And so the next time we have a quality control problem, what is our strategic way of dealing with it? I, again, li- literally, and by the way, I actually learned that from teaching medical students because sometimes we'd have a patient and they'd be telling about that and say, okay, well, this is really interesting, but let's talk about diabetes as a whole, hmm. you, where, you do, you, where you know, you're know, you talking about a p- little problem with a patient who had with their diabetes, but then you use that as a launching pad to talk about, let's talk about globally, how, how, you know, how do we address diabetes and what's our strategy? So I think it is the same concept of, of micro mentoring them where you take the, the problem at hand, but you don't stay granular. You, you, beca- you become satellite and lo- you say, okay, let's talk about the topic as a whole. And eventually you do this enough time, they start adopting the philosophy that you would want without you being there. So after a year or two, you know, the, whoever you put in charge of marketing, they are just going in all cylinders and with barely any contact with you other than what's needed. 
No, that's a great idea. And, uh, you know, we talk about leadership uh, and we always say this as product managers and product marketers that we are often leading projects and leading teams without necessarily the explicit authority. And I think those techniques that you talk about are a great way that we can be leaders, regardless of our titles and our, you know, sort of relational position in the organization um, and provide that context that we know is so key. The other thing is if I give feedback and discussion big, versus nit, what it's going to feel like nitpicking on the, hey, mm-hmm. designer, why did you do this? Hey, developer, mm-hmm. why is it like this? It, it is certainly a healthier conversation, I think, uh, for for both sides as well, as it feels more of a of a partnership. And to, to, when, I, when I ask people who I'm giving critical feedback, it, if I can, you know, if they can be honest with me, I say, hey, do you think we're talking about this because this is something that, just needs criticism or do you think we're, we're rooting for your success and we're trying to elevate your game? So as long as the feedback is absorbed in a way that they're giving me this feedback because they want me to be a success, right? Then yeah. it's absorbed a different way Then I'm just getting critical feedback or I'm just getting feedback for the sake of getting feedback. You, you have to couch it in the reason we're bringing this up is so we can elevate your gain for the next time this comes up. Absolutely. All right. So I do think as we think about leadership um, and I, I just, I think it is a really interesting pivot as you went from, you know, leading medical teams and leading sort of courses to leading a technology company. And as you made that transition, Tell me a little bit about where you personally were like, oh, wow, this is a little bit different and how and how you kind of got into that technology space. Well, healthcare, if you really think about it, is now mired in technology oh, because yeah, that's, that's really the next level of healthcare. Because, I mean, there's still advances in medicine and stuff, but electronic health records and everything is tied in there. So we were, I think the issue became for me is how could we leverage technology to improve healthcare and then beyond? So that, that became a natural. But the first thing I did is really found mentors, both mm. in the technology space and in the leadership space, because um, I knew from my medical training that the only way you get good at medicine is to, by doing residencies and fellowships and having mentors. So that, that, that became obvious. I was so lucky, you know, I stumbled on, at first I made my share of mistakes, but I stumbled onto some great, great people that held my hand and were accessible and open. Uh, and you, you just have to be willing to accept that because, so even if you're, you've made it this far in life, uh, you have to have, you have this ability to park your ego in the parking lot and say, okay, I'm now in a space that I don't know much about, and I'm not going to be the smartest guy in the room. I'm going to shut up and listen and uh, and try to absorb things that I, I know very little about. So number one is just to find a lot of great people, a lot of great uh, mentors, and, and even people who were available by a phone call when I needed them. And so I had an army of people that I could reach out to. And then, of course, yes, then it became an eye opener because... It's all good and fine to have mentors and stuff, but when you realize that you, how you conduct yourself as a leader and how you pick your words and what you say impacts how, how people absorb you, the company, the organization, um, you know, you hear this adage that, you know, people never quit a company. They, they quit their bosses, right? Very few people like will say, oh, I, I hate Hewlett Packard, you know, like, felt like, no, I don't like my boss. And so, oh, so when you realize that, then you realize what an impact you have and what your words and actions and conduct mean. And that awareness, that in itself changes how you approach things. Yep. Yeah, no, I've, we've definitely done that where we've, or I've done that, right. As a leader where I've said things without thinking and the impact on my team is strong and it's much longer than I expected, right? I can't unsay those things Mm -hmm. and finding a ways to to do that while still remaining. What is for me really important is being really transparent, right? Mm -hmm. So how do I be really transparent and open, but also just Mm -hmm. remember that like, how I position this and my reaction that I'm giving them is going to make a really big impact 
uh, wow. is a balance for me that I always have to, I struggle with. <laughs> you know, uh, but I commend you. I, I did a whole podcast on integrity as a leader and how mm. that impacts your relationship, you know, just integrity in business, integrity in, in being a prof- and being a professional. So you, you hit, the, hit the nail on the head because people want to follow people with integrity. People want to follow people who are professional. Uh, and we, it, 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 it has impacts in a lot of places, you know, how you, what kind of relationship you have with your staff, how, you know, how to be professional yet be friendly and not cross certain lines, but still be a human being and, and caring and what have you. So these are all the skill sets that you need to navigate. Yeah. Um, one other area that I was thinking about as I was preparing for this, that I think your, uh, history in, in sort of the medical field may have, may have helped you is often we talk to new CEOs or new founders and they really struggle with allowing the experts on their team to be the experts on the team, right? Like they are Mm -hmm. micromanaging and, and, and they, it's their baby, it's Mm -hmm. their money, it's their company and it's going to be this Mm -hmm. way. And they have really tight controls. Uh, And my first thought was, oh, it must be hard because you're in a technology company and that's not your background. So there's all these other roles. And then I thought, ah, but in the medical section setting, um, having specialists is the norm, right? Yes. And having specialists that you go and turn to when you're like, oh, is a pulmonary thing or is this a cardiology thing? I should... Right. right. You're used to being able to totally. turn and trust that. And I thought, yeah. oh, I bet that was super helpful. And yeah. you're building out a technology company, not feeling like you had to be an expert in all of those, but you knew how to find good experts and leverage them. Totally. You know, you, again, you're one of the very few people that's really that caught on to that analogy without me actually saying it. So it's so true because you, it, to make your own life easier as, as a physician, in your Rolodex, you have to have this go-to infectious disease expert, cardiologist, mm-hmm. orthopedic surgeon. You know, the guy who you can just pick up the phone and say, hey, look, I, you know, I got a tough case here. What you like, you know, help me out here. Which, by the way, I've done so many podcasts on that. You know, one of the things like I would only call the specialists that were good, but would answer their phone. Mm-hmm. Right. So, mm-hmm. so I just did a podcast on availability. Right. Because you, you can be the greatest orthopedic surgeon, but if your referring doctors can't get a hold of you, uh, you know, whatever. So, you, I mean, you may you may be busy for some other reason, but it won't be because your colleagues are, are you know, <laughs> yeah, looking to you. That's very true. Right. So what I try to tell people is that yeah, those examples taught me a lot. And it taught me that also how to vet out. Mm. Right. How to vet out vendors. I just did a thing on how to pick the right vendor. It was very similar, you know, how to pick the orthopedic surgeon that you really trust and what have you. So uh, there's a lot of parallels because you don't want to just pick the cheapest one. The, you, know, you want to pick the best qualified person, whether you're picking a, a product vendor or parts vendor or anything. Uh, and how, um, you know, how, how, <laughs> how that initial Zoom meeting goes when you're meeting the other team. Right. I mean, uh, have the, do they know anything about you? Have they looked at your website? Are, are they just churning you for, yes, another client or they seem vested in you? These are all skill sets that I probably picked up earlier. But, you know, and I, I did a podcast on that, you know, how to how's that Zoom call with your new vendor? You yeah. know, what are you looking for? Um, do they and is all is everyone talking or just one person talking? They're like six people on a Zoom call. And one person's doing all the talking. You're like, well, where, where are all these other people? <laughs> and, and so, the, yeah, so vetting out is where I'm getting at is also part of that and picking the right team and put to, putting together uh, the great team of lawyers, you know, um, vendors, what have you. You, you have to um, seek and find the best because your likelihood to succeed as a company is a function of many things, including what kind of staff you have, how motivated you are, what kind of vendors you found. You know, what kind of pe- uh, pe- partners that you have found? And they, that could be the difference between making it or not. I totally agree. I think the impact can be huge. I think, you know, the stakes were so high when you were, were working as a doctor, right? That you really had mm-hmm. to hone these, right? And But being able mm-hmm. to bring that same level of skill to these other conversations, because it's, it's 
I wouldn't say it's equally important because it's not like life or death, but it is huge impact. These relationships that you have with vendors, the hires that you pick, your small company, those early hires are critical. Those are, those are a really big deal. And being able to vet that, to vet it, to find good ones, and then to trust in the good ones you have, uh, I think is just really important. Yeah. Uh, the first five hires that uh, you, you hire in a startup, Basically, that already seals your faith. I mean, mm. if your first right hand person is clocking in and clocking out, mm. you're toast. Yep. You know, you're, 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 whatever great idea you had, however money you raised, you know, if your first three hires are clocking in and out and you know, whatever, it, it's over. I mean, it's, yeah. it's finished. So one thing, uh, another thing that I was thinking about as I was thinking about, and then I thought, oh, I wonder, I might just be wrong here. As I was like, oh, the speed though of innovation when I think of medicine, I think of it as slower than the technology space, which I think is probably wrong, particularly in certain mm. fields. But but then I wondered about that, right? So when you when you go from the speed that the technology sector moves in, and when you're focused on innovation, right? I know one of your organizations is like the Uber of preventative medicine, right? Like those mm. are really innovative initiatives. That's about being really key. How has that switch been? What did you bring with you from your medical background? And like, what did you need to add on? that maybe was new uh, as you worked on the technology companies? Yeah, I think what medicine taught me that has helped me the most, you know, I have a saying that um, I was taught uh, in medicine when I was a medical student, which then I passed on generationally to many other healthcare professionals, is that the plural of anecdote is not data. Okay. Hmm. You know, and I think, in medicine, it's very tempting to say, oh, I, there was three patients that did well when I gave them this or, or that. Mm. And mm -hmm. you, you, you can't then say, oh, well, obviously that must work, uh, you know. And so uh, I think you have to be really careful not to extrapolate a bunch of different anecdotes and, and say, oh, that's, that's data, you know, right? So be, before we made a big decision about major changes, you wanted to see real statistical data on, th on things that actually work or don't work. I think we saw this a lot in, in COVID where st stuff came by and went and this and that because there wasn't data, but mm -hmm. yet people would, you know, adopt things or what have you. So I think the same thing. I think we are a very data-driven organization now. You know, we, 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 we don't believe, oh, yeah, we think that product is selling well, or we, we think that thing is too, yeah, I, yeah, I see some of you know, we want to see the charts. We want to see the the pie graph. We want to see the, the year over year and and stuff like that. So, which really, because I think human nature um, can fool you. You know, um, mm -hmm. one of the things that you know we did uh, on on the business that we have, where we take incoming calls, for example, is you know we went to our sales staff because, well, you know, how are we doing on those incoming calls? Oh, we're, you know, yeah, we're getting, yeah, a few people don't want to book an appointment, but the, but when we measured it, it was only like 30%. So what we did is we actually created a course where we trained the staff on how to answer the call and it jumped up to 80%, but oh, wow. they were, mm. they, they thought they were killing it at 30% because they remembered the appointments they made mm -hmm, and, the, mm -hmm. the, and the ones that they didn't make was, well, yeah, that guy didn't want to come in and it was not, it's nothing I did. Uh, and so they were so proud of 30%. Uh, but, and that's human nature. You kind of remember your successes and mm -hmm. you forget about your failures <laughs> or you, the failures aren't really failures or there's something else. And so when you, me when you measure it, then all of a sudden you can, you can act on it. No, that makes a ton of sense. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit more then about, I mean, that's the other thing I think that is just clear in talking to you that you are very invested in making and continually improving your employees, helping them grow, right? Not in, uh, mm -hmm. And I think that that's, a, a, again, probably part of that teacher background, right? And the importance you knew from your mentors, like people taught you along. And so helping them kind of continually develop um, is clearly a, 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 big, a big aspect of you in terms of how you kind of create your employee culture. Um, tell me a little bit more about other techniques that you do for that and what other kind of key tenets of your culture, um, are really important as you start not one, not two, but three different businesses. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
I think the central tenet that we talk about is that most employees and staff in the United States fall into three categories. They're either clocking in or out, uh, and they're doing a good job, but they're clocking in and out. The other categories, you know, they really feel a sense of ownership, right? They, they, they really, you know, it's their company. Mm. Don't mess with this company or I'll take out your kidney or something. <laughs> you know, I, I, okay, you, you mess with us, you're, you're dealing with me. You know, they, 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 this is their baby. They're not necessarily, this is the, they're not going to say, oh, this is my lane. That's, that, everything is their lane. You know, like uh, if, if I can help move the ball forward, I'm all in. The majority of jobs in the United States don't require that. The majority of jobs, you get a job at Macy's, they want you to clock in, clock out, you know, s- sell some blouses or shoes, be nice to the customers, you know, don't piss anyone off and go home. Uh, so, so when you're in a startup or in a, a very competitive field, you can't, you can't really afford that. You can't have people who are coming in and meshing into the wallpaper, doing a great job, clocking in and clocking out. So the challenge becomes, okay, most people come to you, they're not used to having this owner mentality. One, how can you ask them to become an owner? And, and what's in it for them if they do become an owner? You can't just say, be have an owner because that'll help our company. Right. You have to, you have to say, listen, if, if you... Ha- if you do adopt this mentality, you know, you, the sky is going to be the limit professionally and financially for you. Right. So I've had people literally who started off in my organization as the lowest level administrative person you can imagine, minimum wage or slightly above, whatever. And now they're vice presidents. And, and, oh. I, and it's all because of that. I, I'm an owner. We reward that mentality. We cultivate for it. We, we acknowledge it and, and we, we mentor for it hmm. because it's not a normal position. Because if someone just came from a regular marketing company or some other company, they were rewarded for clocking in and out and doing a great job. But that's it. They, were, they weren't asked to uh, own this company. As I always tell uh, people, like, I'll be talking with someone I'm mentoring and I'm, and I, and I say to them, well, let me ask you a question. If I sold you this company right now for a dollar, like here's a piece of paper, just sign here. Okay. Give me a dollar and, and the company is yours. Would you show up tomorrow and give me a different product? Hmm. They're like, well, yeah, if you sold me the company, yeah, oh, yeah, of course I come in. I learned this. I live. I'm like, well, Okay, so that so that's where we're going with that, right? Yep. So yeah, we want basically that product, even though you don't own the company, but in essence, you will own the company because as our as the company grows, you're going to grow professionally and financially. So the tie-in is there. It's just not official where we sign some paper and you give me a dollar. Uh, that's a hard thing to get over uh, because it's not an ask that most companies make. Mm. We're, and so, and you can't just day one tell someone, hey, be an owner. It's, it's like, you know, go, going on your first date and say, hey, so what do you want to name the kids? Uh, you know, it's, it's just not going to go over well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, that might be a little strong. But I also think you have to demonstrate, I think it's important that they see that you not just want the behavior, that you reward it, Right. Uh, there's yes. nothing more heartbreaking than being the employee who has that feeling and it just being met with, you know, no recognition, no acknowledgement. You get the same rewards as the person, you know, is clocking in next to you. Right. So the fact that right. you ask of it, but then demonstrate it regularly that it's rewarded, um, if it's got to be a, a very strong feeder into your yeah. environment and culture. Yeah. And that's why I led with that, because mm-hmm. if, if you, if you can't say the sky's the limit professionally and financially. If you give us this, maybe not on year one, the not, but you know, and I think they look around and say, you know what, gee golly, if anyone who's been in this organization for more than five years would have to take a big pay cut to go anywhere else. I mean, they mm-hmm. just would have to. Okay. I mean, it may not happen day, you know, day one, year one, or I mean, still good, but we're very competitive. But long term, I think they look around and say, oh, gee golly, the, the, seems like the people who've uh, done this are doing good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the ones who haven't, uh, you know, are, are not in these positions. So 
uh, I'd like to, I like to get a piece of that. I love that. So like, what's, what's next? What's next for your companies? What's next for you as you build them out? I mean, it's such a, it's such a great ride in the, in the organizations, which we can talk about a little bit more too. The ones that you've built are really strong. What is your next, what are you doing next? Yeah, we're really in an exciting position because I think for one of our companies, our technology platform for U.S. Drug Test Centers, we're it's such a great platform that we are sitting on, our company is sitting on, that we're going to actually offer that platform to our competitors. So we oh. basically become a SaaS, you know. Oh, to, everybody loves we, that. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. Right, the Holy Grail. Uh, so I think that's really, we're so excited. We're going to a national conference this week, actually, I think on Wednesday to start putting uh, the seeds of that into the uh, our community or our our group of companies that we work with. Uh, so we're excited about that. That's really taking our technology that we have built for our own companies and seeing how we can impact the entire industry. So uh, I would say the next 12 months is going to be full of that, I think. That's amazing. I can't wait to hear what happens. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right, Dr. Patari, we talked about lots of different things today. I think it was it was a great conversation. There's so many lessons from your career now and from your back your history, right? That can really help here. But if you were going to have listeners do two things differently tomorrow based on what we talked about today, what would that be? As a leader, I would just understand that your job is to really enroll people into your vision, and that doesn't happen by accident. So enroll your people in your vision, you have to convey to them that you want the best for them and you want the best for the company. And if they follow you and, and get enrolled, it could only mean great things for them. Then on a more practical side, I would say, look at your technology, look at your processes and see how much busy work you can take away from, mm. from people uh, by, by leveraging technology or coming up with processes. Yeah, I know this is to be true because sometimes we would come up with something and be like, why didn't we think of this three years ago? It, 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 it's, it was, it, you know, we could just get rid of that. Well, why are we even doing that? Mm. Um, and I and I think there's this attitude that it's always been like that. Yep. And I, so I, I would tell people, take, take a fresh look at all your processes and see what, what, especially when it's not client facing or product facing, it doesn't really do anything in terms of sales or improving clients' lives, but it's work you have to do. Focus on reducing or eliminating as much of that as humanly possible. I love that. I love just for A, making sure it still matters and B, if it does, there's so many new technologies that can help with those pieces and making sure we're leveraging those. Because if I take that off the plate of my employees, mm -hmm. I free up time for big thinking and creativity yes. and that ownership mentality that's really hard to, to, to feel when you're just running to, to get the, the sort of grind done. Um, excellent. Well, it's advice. funny if I can just add to that, because like a lot of times company invests in technologies that actually impact their bottom line. What I would argue is if you sometimes you there are technology you can invest in that doesn't make you have more sales but takes work away from your staff. Mm, mm -hmm. Okay, I'm I'm I would argue that taking work away from your staff, even if it doesn't translate into the bottom line immediately, long term it will. It will in terms of employee happiness, retention, commitment, and ultimately that will translate into your bottom line. So think about that. Even employee retention, you know, if you could take 50% of someone's busy work away, um, I can promise you they're, they're going to be a lot happier coming to work if what they're working on is more create, they're using their creative or sales juice and not doing other stuff. Excellent advice. All right. This was super fun. Uh, I know you have a podcast and you do some other ratings where if people want to follow you and hear more, where can they go? Yeah, Bakhtari MD is our podcast, which is on YouTube, of course, and Spotify and all the other platforms. You can follow me at Bakhtari MD on LinkedIn, as well as you're welcome to check out all our websites. The links are all in Bakhtari MD. And we actually have a web website called BakhtariMD.com, which also has all those links and all the podcasts that I've been on, as well as all the podcasts we do and all the 
national interviews we've done. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. Rebecca, thanks so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. All right. That does it for today's episode. Thanks everyone for listening. And don't forget to join us next week when we tackle another great topic designed to help elevate your product, your company, and your career. 